tutorial video. This time around, we're going to focus on a very, very specific topic, which is what you do with stock-based compensation or equity-based compensation in a discounted cash flow analysis. Now, this comes up because in a DCF, you have to project a company's free cash flows over time. And it can be confusing to figure out what to do with different items, whether to include items, whether to exclude them, whether to add new items, whether to remove items. And stock-based compensation is one particular item that has attracted a lot of controversy and different opinions about what to do with it. So normally in a DCF, when you project a company's free cash flows, we recommend against memorizing formulas. We think that the best way to think about it is that you take a company's cash flow statement, you remove non-recurring items. So if something is really non-recurring, it only happened once in the past three or five years, it's probably not going to happen every year in the future, so you should probably leave it out. And then you also remove financing related items. So anything related to cash or debt or share repurchases or anything like that that isn't truly a part of a company's core business operations, you want to leave out. This also means that you will have to adjust some other numbers on the cash flow statement, such as net income. And you have to use NOPAT instead of net income to remove the effect of interest income and interest expense, for example. Here's the problem, though. In practice, it is harder to implement this than it sounds. There are some items that are easy. For example, everyone agrees that you should add back depreciation and amortization when you calculate unlevered free cash flow. Now, people will disagree about maybe the exact amounts to add back or how to project it or things like that, but pretty much everyone agrees that it should be there. The change in working capital is another item that is pretty easy to rationalize and include because if a company needs to spend money in advance of revenue growth, you have to reflect that. And if net income is lower or higher than a company's actual cash flow because of inventory or receivables or deferred revenue, you also have to reflect that. But some items are borderline and it's not always clear what to do or how to treat them. One area where these borderline items come up a lot is with the non-cash adjustments on a company's financial statements. And the question is, should you really count everything in that non-cash adjustment section of the cash flow statement in future periods? Are there items you should leave out because they're non-recurring? Are there items that you should leave out because of other issues? And that's what we're going to focus on here. So here's an example for Jazz Pharmaceuticals. Here's what the top part of their cash flow from operations section looks like. And with many of these items, there's actually no controversy at all. So when you start calculating unlevered free cash flow, yes, you're going to start with net income, but you modify it. You use NOPAT, net operating profit after taxes, as I just showed you in this Excel file, because we want to exclude the impact of interest expense. And then as you move down, yes, you're going to add back amortization and depreciation. Everyone agrees about those. Something like loss and disposal of property and equipment, you're probably not going to add back because it's unpredictable. You don't know whether they're going to sell any property and equipment in future years. And then a lot of these other items like excess tax benefits, inventory, fair value step up, the change in the value of earnouts, contingent consideration, other items like that, you are probably going to leave out entirely, or if you include them, you're going to make them relatively small. Something like deferred income taxes would be an example of that. Now, if something really is recurring, such as these other non-cash transactions, okay, then you might include that. But for the most part, a lot of these items are non-recurring, and so you're not going to add them back. Stock-based compensation, or as they call it here, share-based compensation, presents a very different issue, though. I've said before that it is better to actually leave this out entirely, so to delete this along with everything else that we deleted right here, so all these other items, to so just remove this one entirely, because of the fact that it creates more shares. When a company issues stock-based compensation, options or restricted stock units or just normal shares to employees. No, they don't pay anything in cash right now, but they've created 
more shares and they've reduced how much of the company all the other investors own. So this is going to have the effect of reducing the company's per share value. Even if it's a private company, the same thing applies because private companies also have shares. A lot of people don't understand this or they go back and forth and they argue about what to do and they say, well, stock-based compensation is a non-cash expense, just like depreciation and amortization. And just like you add those back because they're not cash and they're recurring, you should also add back stock-based compensation. The problem is that that argument doesn't really describe it correctly, and it shows that whoever is saying that doesn't really understand stock-based compensation. It's not like depreciation and amortization, because with both of those, those are cash payments, capital expenditures or acquisitions or acquiring intangible assets where you spend the money up front and then you just recognize the expense over time. Now, you do add that back, that expense back in a DCF, but the reason you add it back is because you've already reflected the spending in prior periods. So you're not adding it back because you get a magical unicorn that just says, hey, take some free money. You thought you spent it, but you didn't really do it. You did spend it in previous years and now you're just recognizing it, and that's why you're adding it back there, and because of the tax savings that come from that. But with stock-based compensation, you're creating dilution. Unlike with CapEx and DNA, there is no previous spending here. Instead, the company simply issues shares, and the employees now own more of the company, and the investors own less. So if you buy into this argument that you should add back stock-based compensation, it would be a little like if you said to someone, I'll pay you to manage my $10 million house for me, and I'm not going to pay you in cash, but I'm going to give you a small percentage of ownership in my house each year that you manage it, and that'll be your compensation. Well, when you go to sell that house at the end of the period, you're not going to get 100% of the value because you don't own 100% of the house. And that's exactly the same issue that comes up here. If you add back this expense, it's like you're saying, you know what? I can pay someone to manage my house. I can give them 1% or 2% of the value. And at the end, I'm still going to have 100%, which makes no sense at all. So as I say here, when you add it back, it's sort of like you are getting a free lunch. Let's look at this more specifically and see how it is fundamentally different from depreciation and amortization. So as I mentioned, with depreciation and amortization, this really reflects the cash the company previously spent in prior periods and is just recognizing now. And the other important distinction is that even in the future, it's not as if you just add back the spending for prior years, the recognition of the spending in prior years. You keep including CapEx spending in each future year of the DCF and even in the terminal period you still keep subtracting that spending on capital expenditures. So you keep it there every year, or at least you should. If someone says you shouldn't, they really don't know what they're talking about. Really, if you think about what's happening here, it's just a timing difference. It's not as if you're saying, you know what, we're going to add back these non-cash expenses and get some tax benefits. Even though we didn't spend anything, you did spend something. And it's just a matter of when you spent it versus when you recognize it. So here's an example on the financial statements again. When you have depreciation and amortization, typically it's going to correspond to some very specific items within cash flow from investing. Usually purchases of property and equipment, CapEx, and amortization can also correspond to acquisition of intangible assets, the purchase of product rights, even something like acquisitions, which we've checked off and eliminated in here. Depreciation and amortization do often correspond to those acquired assets. So when you project a company's free cash flows, if you're adding back depreciation and amortization, you need to keep including these types of items, spending on capital assets. And then, of course, the spending here simply flows into these non-cash addbacks right here. So yes, you're adding them back, but it's because you had this prior spending and it's just a timing difference there. Notice also how none of this affects the ownership of the company. So yes, you are adding back depreciation and amortization, but 
You're not creating new shares. You're not eliminating shares. And so the ownership of the company is not changing as a result of this. And so it is very, very different from stock-based compensation. With stock-based compensation, if you think about this and use this analogy, if you simply add back stock-based compensation in a DCF, it would be like adding back depreciation and amortization, but then not subtracting capital expenditures in the free cash flow projections. Can you imagine doing that? Can you imagine going into your DCF analysis and saying, okay, you know what? Let's just add back a bunch of items here, including depreciation and amortization, but let's also not subtract capital expenditures. Let's just keep that out because we get depreciation and amortization as a non-cash add back from the tooth fairy. Now, when you do that, of course, the company's valuation is going to go up by a lot because their free cash flow is going to increase, but it's also completely incorrect. You need to always subtract that. Even if you're looking at a simpler analysis, the same thing applies. It would be like if you literally said, you know what? We don't need CapEx in future years. We're just going to leave this out entirely and the company gets all that extra free cash flow. Well, the company's share price roughly doubles or the implied share price roughly doubles when you do that. But of course, it's also completely incorrect because a company needs to keep spending on its capital assets to keep operating and functioning. Now, this brings up the question of how do you actually estimate what stock-based compensation really costs? Because if you think about it, something like capital expenditures and DNA, that's very easy to estimate because the company tells you, here's how much we spent on product rights or acquisitions or buildings, factories, equipment, and here's the depreciation period. And based on that, you can get all the numbers. With stock-based compensation, though, it is much trickier. Now, you could try to estimate what the company is going to pay out in the future, or more accurately, let's say in the future, when employees go to exercise their options or they receive shares from the company, you could try to estimate the dollar value or whatever currency value associated with that. So you could say they got options with an exercise price of $10, and we think in the future the share price is going to be $20 per share. So based on that, we can estimate how much it's really costing us. The problem is it's very difficult to actually do that because you don't know what the share price is going to be in the future. Remember, in any type of valuation analysis, you're not estimating the future share price in a DCF. You're estimating what the company should be worth today based on those future expectations. And so you can't exactly do that reasonably in most cases. So solution number one would be to estimate instead the number of shares created from stock-based compensation. So maybe you go into your analysis and you say, okay, well, we know that they are spending about 12 to 17 or 18 million in stock-based compensation each year for employees. Based on that and their current share price, we think that their share count, their diluted shares at sending is going to go up by about 20 million by the end of the period. So we're going to have 262 million diluted shares instead. And as a result, our implied share price goes down because we have more shares. We have more entities that own shares in our company. But that is also quite tricky because, again, you have to know details about how their stock-based compensation plans work, about what the exercise prices on options are, and also what the share price is going to be in the future. Because you're attempting to estimate the number of future shares that get created and then come up with some number that represents what that is today. So we don't really think that's the best way to do this. We think the best way to handle it is to simply not add back stock-based compensation as a non-cash expense. To pretend that just like paying employees in salaries or in health insurance or in other benefits, it's just a normal cash expense and something that you should completely ignore in a DCF analysis when you're projecting free cash flow. So here's an example. Going to our Jazz Pharmaceuticals example here, stock-based compensation, we would simply just delete this line altogether. Maybe you could leave it and leave the label and then just delete all the numbers and footnote it and say that we're leaving it out to reflect dilution from this. And then in 
the steel dynamics analysis here, we would do the same thing. We would just say, you know what? Equity-based compensation in the future is irrelevant. We can even delete some of the historical numbers here because we are counting this as a true cash expense. And you could footnote that and explain your reasoning there to show that it creates dilution. It's going to reduce the implied share price of the company. Rather than attempting to estimate the number of shares that get created from it, you simply count it as a cash expense that reduces the company's free cash flow. And that's what we prefer to do in this case. Now, you might be wondering, is this really the best method? Are there other ways to do it? And there are some issues with this as well. For example, the value in the future might be a lot higher if the share price increases or if the stock-based compensation terms change. But again, it brings us back to other methods, such as estimating the number of shares, are even less precise and less accurate. This method is simpler. It's based on the company's own estimates for the value of stock-based compensation as determined usually with the Black-Scholes method. Since it is simpler and since it is based on real numbers for the value in historical periods, we think this is the better way to do it. And if you want to project it going forward, you could just make it a percent of revenue. You could factor it in and you should factor it in when you have a number like operating income because stock-based compensation will always reduce operating income and you can just leave it like that in your model. And then one final note, in some of our other tutorials and elsewhere on the site and elsewhere in our example lessons, we're not exactly following this treatment everywhere, but we are changing this in the future. This is one of those issues that a long time ago, there was a lot of debate over, but there has been more of a consensus over time. And now we think that it is best to treat stock-based compensation as a real cash expense in a DCF analysis. So just to do a quick recap and summary here, stock-based compensation, even though it is a non-cash adjustment on the cash flow statement, is very different from depreciation and amortization because it doesn't represent an upfront cash payment that's recognized as an expense over time. It creates dilution, the employees now own more, and other investors now own a lower percentage of the company, which reduces the implied share price for everyone. If you add it back and leave it at that in a DCF, then it's sort of like you're getting a free lunch and you don't want to do that. So our preferred treatment is to treat it as a cash expense to simply not add it back at all in a DCF to leave that blank and then to make sure that the implied share price goes down appropriately depending on how much in stock-based compensation you're assuming that the company issues over time. 